Namaste and welcome to our continuing series Evenings with Shadala. Namaste. We will continue with the levels above mind and there was a question. We discussed over the last three sessions the levels of mind above the intellect and the transition from the mind of ignorance to the mind of knowledge through an intermediate passage of a mind of self-forgetful knowledge that Sri Aurobindo calls. Uh, we looked in detail at various levels of consciousness from the higher mind, illumined mind, intuitive mind, over mental and gradations exist within those and the supramental proper with gradations in between all the way to the highest supramental. And an important conclusion that we came to was that the intuition is the first point of contact where we touch the supramental, so to say. Of course, we are not in the supramental consciousness, but the ray of the truth is available as a finite point of contact. And everything above intuition is only a further development of an opening into infinity and aspects of infinity from there. But anything below the intuition is still form and process of mind and therefore unreliable and uh, unstable. So Sri Aurobindo puts great importance on settling ourselves in the intuitive mind and making that like a first base of stability. He uh, describes the whole process of intuitivizing the mind in broadly four different efforts. And the rationale of this is very simple. Your current mind is completely the opposite of, in all its habits, in all its tendencies, in all its, in all its working, it's the complete opposite of the mind of knowledge. Where the mind of knowledge is infinite, your current mind is handling finite pieces, finite thoughts, finite ideas, cannot handle infinity. It can only keep on assembling finite pieces in different combinations. And that is always boom, one whole infinite. And so how does this work like that? It cannot. Equally, your current mind operates from outside in. I look at a flower, I see only its shape and then I try to guess what its internal powers are. I look at a person's face, I see him smiling and I try to guess what he is thinking. Is his smile genuine? Is it fake? What is his interest? Is he trying to please me? Is he about to kill me and putting a smile to come close? I cannot know because I am going outside in. And the mind of knowledge is inherently inside out. It is one with what it knows. As it looks at the person, it is one with the whole and from its deepest depths knows not only the thoughts, the feelings, the whole turn of his nature and the line of development of the person's journey even in time and space. So they are completely different in their working. And so how is this going to be a vehicle for that or how is this going to rise into that? And so this becomes the challenge. So the first requirement we saw last time was the necessity for the current operations of the mind to come into complete silence. And that's not enough because when the intuition, let's say, gives it a nudge, it will still jump up and seize and distort when it moves into action. So silence is at best a first step. Into that must come the change of habits so that when from silence it moves to express, it must move led by that and not led by its old habits. So there are two sides to the training. The stilling is the passive side. The allowing to be led is the active side. So can you allow your mind to be led in its thought process? What does it even feel like? You see, we are so used to thinking by our effort. To let go and let something else lead and carry. It's a different experience. Even in the physical body we resist. If somebody leads us too much, we feel the need to assert our individuality 
and independence in the mind it's even more uh, uh, just as an aside the mother made a very important distinction between the architect and the engineer in their training they are in this way separate the engineer his job and his training is to take the design given by the architect and turn it faithfully precisely into the outcome he has no right to change whereas the architect in his very nature inherently wants to assert his uniqueness his creativity and his um ego his independence so when mother gave the design of the matra mandir she allowed the architect his elements of fancy and they were fanciful many of them and then she would nudge the fellow push him a little bit here there knowing when he has come up with something too fanciful she knows this is not it she'll say yes let's think a little more let's try a little more and give him a little nudge inside but helping him from inside and him not realizing that his job was to allow her to lead him to the vision of what she had and he's busy trying to assert himself and interestingly you saw this tendency even uh, among his followers the architect said this he was mother's architect whatever he said we have to follow and it was like fixing into something not trying to feel what mother wants or what the higher intuition would lead you to so the necessity in the architect is to assert himself but the engineer is different so when it finally came to the inside chamber of the matra mandir mother said i won't speak to the architect she called only the engineer and she gave precise measurements precise elements of the design because that was the most critical part for her but this is part of the training of our mind can we train our mind not only to remain in a state of quiet but allow it to be led and at that point you are not passive you have to be active something gently carries you you have to participate you have to move with it so it's a whole different training and these two are as if complementary so the first step is being able to silence the mind and there are many methods one can use to silence you will find open any book of uh, mind training mind development yoga and a whole lot of new fangled terms they have invented uh, in systems for training the mind all of them draw on the yoga knowledge basically and build variations on it there are the most crude and superficial methods which involve let's say observing the breath and your mind detaches itself observing the breath it separates from the body perhaps even separates from its own thoughts and gets to some level of calm these are simple they are useful for somebody who has absolutely no other capacity of the mind to even become conscious in the mind it's like a first step of becoming aware in the mind but very quickly one can outgrow these and get to something more direct um there is a more direct action which will be the will of the mind willing itself into silence and it's a useful exercise i will highly recommend this although it's not the easiest way for our purpose because in its very nature you are pushing imposing controlling but try it out stop thought now and hold your mind in a state without thought and the moment you notice a thought comes stop it another thought comes stop it another thought stop it and stay like that now if we were doing a workshop i would wait for <laughs> all of us to do this but when you start doing you'll notice very quickly that as soon as you stop one thought another pops up you stop that and another pops up and it's unending and as you stop 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 you become more and more tense and more and more like that and you can relax after a while the mind itself can relax and then you'll find it's easier to be quiet in a relaxed state than in this active tense activity but if you've gone through all these exercises it is extremely helpful because you gain a first control of the mind these are things which should have been taught in our school training in our childhood as basic practices I remember when i was in the school it was in the age 11 12 because i was listening to lectures of my teacher mp pandit every day almost he had <coughs> these lectures and i was familiar with these ideas that you should be able to silence your mind you should be able to control your thoughts and all those things uh, normally people don't tell you these things at that age 
so when we would have a morning uh, music in school and uh, then some kind of meditation mostly children close their eyes and they dream and i would say okay one day i just remember i just had this idea well why don't i spend this time trying to practice this not thinking and so i began this process a very tight rigid uh, force of will and i could push it to 5 seconds and then 10 seconds and then 15 seconds and it was too much there was a tension building up in the mind i could push it to 20 to 30 seconds which was quite a good achievement considering uh, the kind of tension it builds but then spontaneously it gave way to a more uh, relaxed way but it's doable at that age we should be able to do it as adults and if you have the key that you don't need to be tense you can do it in a more relaxed way you'll find you can hold that state for quite a long time but you notice your mind is primarily aware in a intellectual grade it's the thought layer in which you have got the silence and that's good into this now you have to connect or bring in something else so this from the silence it's not enough you have to turn up as a feeling or opening to something wider something larger so it can often take the form that your thinking mind which you feel pretty much identified with the brain is as if turning to become conscious and feeling something wider higher if meanwhile you have had certain experiences of the presence of the divine mother presence of the divine then this state of silence is turned to the awareness of that presence and there is an immersion in it this is the easiest way to hold and stay and therefore it's also the easiest way to reach the silence of the mind where instead of fighting struggling and all that and please do those exercises because it will give you a certain skill of playing with your thoughts you can stop a thought you can turn your mind away from a thought uh, maybe i'll just dwell on this a little more because it's a useful skill you see we often are plagued with some persistent thoughts and especially negative thoughts which bother us and they can even take the form of fears little children may have an associated idea or object or thing they are afraid of and then it keeps popping up as adults it's not too different it takes more complex form what if i lose this what if so and so dies what if this doesn't happen or happens or whatever and instead of struggling with that if you have trained your mind you should be able to direct your mind to a thought that you want or withdraw awareness from a thought that you don't want and this skill is very useful it's still a mental training but if you've got to this then all the rest of the things become much easier because then you are able to manage distractions easily if you've not worked on it you'll find at pretty advanced stages of practice uh, you will still find the distracting thoughts bothering you so you sit down and you want to put your mind into a state of quiet and all the things which you have not been thinking about now rush in Oh, I have to finish this work. I have to finish that work. Oh my God, I've neglected this for the last two weeks, and I'd forgotten, and all the memories rush back. <laughs> and so, to be able to say, "All right, stay away now. Don't bother me. I'll discuss this later." To be able to push out, refuse, or ignore is as much a power as being able to concentrate to hold a state of concentration, and it's still a mental skill. So, it's useful to have developed all this. So the most direct way then is therefore to put your mind let's say in a relaxed quiet state and turn it towards the experience of the presence in whatever way you feel it you feel it within you you feel it above you you feel it around you these are typically the three broad ways and you become aware of the presence and your entire mind more and more becomes quiet and opens itself to the presence and invites the presence the stillness and even eventually the peace which is in the presence and so one of the most powerful methods is to turn the mind's awareness to the presence which is above and it is as if above the head is this vast presence of the divine ocean of peace and we stay open to it and then allow it slowly to descend and settle more and more in the mind and it brings a complete stillness when it settles sufficiently even the mind becomes as if numb its habit of activity begins to be dissolved 
and you can find you find yourself able to stay aware with no effort without thought and as long as you want or as long as you feel that presence and the presence fills you in the nature of the yoga though we will not focus on one single goal if that thing settles in your mind it should equally pres- settle in your life energies even into your body into your physical tissue and nerves even and so we would want this to come all the way down into the whole being which of course makes the most stable base for the mind also to now open to the higher uh, possibilities so this would be like a first basic practice the result of it very quickly you will find at least for short durations you can stay in a reasonably quieted state later that quietness will deepen become more wide more deep and become like a deep solid peace in which thought is becomes impossible and yet you are able to exercise activity choice and even think when you want but the agitation of thought becomes impossible that is no more there is a restlessness and one should be able to bring it to that point you had a question about what happens when suddenly this comes yes but you see what happened in this experience uh, when a, a kind of a solidity of the silence came that you are unable to think the first reaction you have is of panic something has gone wrong and you want to understand what's gone wrong and you want to get out of it and if you think about the rationale after all that we have discussed you should rather be saying oh what a wonderful gift let me stay in this for the rest of my life <laughs> but because it's so different because it's so different we tend to think that we have become stupid i have suddenly become an idiot i can't think because we valued our life or our mind in terms of its ability to be restless and this has to change and that's why initially this um letting go of the past habit takes a little time for most people if there has already been some preparation of practice where people are used to sitting in quiet or being in a space where to be less active in thought etc has been inculcated and it's part of your so to say dna then you don't feel the struggle so much and that's why sri aurobindo's insistence on the psychic influence because that feeling tends to bring with it automatically a kind of a stillness and a sensitivity to the presence and a sense of purity clarity in which when this happens and the mind becomes silenced we don't feel it as something odd and it's not the difference is not so stark it feels almost familiar oh it's so nice you say and then you're happy to stay in it but had you known that when you had this experience you would have said oh wow wonderful stay on <laughs> you'll remember uh, sri arbindo narrating this he says somebody had come to him asking for the experience of silence of mind because in the yoga tradition they speak of it as one of the great goals so sri arbindo says okay sit down and then he continues reading the newspaper and after a while this fellow suddenly experiences this complete stilling and silencing of the mind and similarly he can't think anymore he jumps up and says i'm going mad i'm going mad and mm-hmm. runs away mm-hmm. and sri arbindo says it's a typical reaction of a mind which is not yet ready and that's why the a lot of the initial phase of becoming ready uh, saves us all this but if you have understanding of what it is what it represents if you have glimpses of the experience that prepares much more in your dna it's a way of saying that it's in a part of your nature that you are used to either the idea of it or even being in a space where things are like this it let's say it could be this birth it could be previous births even if it is in previous births in this birth there's always an occasion where it is recovered to be reintegrated so it can take many forms you see there are people who enjoy very much being in a silent space or spontaneously they tune into the silence it may be you go into a forest and in a forest you could be very active let me dig a hole let me do this let me explore let me note down or you just feel the listen to the birds and listen to the trees and somehow you tune into the silence behind all that 
Why did you do that? Because something in you instinctively enjoyed it. And then you can say, oh, it's something familiar from previous life. But still, you have to develop it. You have to imprint it into your present personality. So some people have it naturally, especially those who are more introverted tend to uh, stay like this. It could happen in a beautiful space or it could happen in a space which you, for you is consciously uplifting. You go at the ashram, you sit near the samadhi, or you sit in a state of prayer or meditation. You read a book sometimes, a spiritually uplifting or inspiring book. And then it something touches you, it fills you. You've read a few lines of Savitri and then you close the book and stay in it. And allow the assimilation. And automatically, instinctively, you will tend to be in a state of reasonable, silent receptivity. It may not be a total mental silence, but at least that backdrop is there. So all of these types of things would make it that in your nature, there's a familiarity. And so there is not the panic and the worry. And so when it comes, you feel good and then you want to stay like that. Problem is, at first, you may want to stay like that for a long time. And then you say, oh, but I have work. How will I do my work? So at first, the silence is in contrast to activity of work. But later as it deepens, and then we use the word peace much more, but it can still be a silence, then you can hold that even as you engage with work and you don't lose it or it remains more like a backdrop. And if you have brought it to that point, that's of course the most uh, valuable on which then the other practices for developing intuition can grow. If you have brought it to this point, one of the benefits will be the part in you that is so to say leading back in silence while the other part in you is moving in activity of thought or work. In that part which you are conscious of now, which is in silence, the intuition can settle and develop. And from there it can fill and guide your active part. And this is the most valuable. Because then the intuition, the link to intuition and activity begins to form more and more. In the beginning though, these two parts may not be simultaneous. So I go into silence and then I engage in work. And then I pause and go back into silence and then re-engage in work. I open to intuition and then turn to actualize what came in intuition. Then when I lose myself and get into a crisis or a problem, I stop again to feel what the intuition would want. So there's this back and forth. But after some time when the double awareness develops, it begins to be uh, more and more just a shift of emphasis. I'm more in the activity of expression or more in tune to receive. And at some point the two become so continuous that there's no more a gap. The intuition comes, flows into action, and even as you act the next wave, or eventually a continuous stream, no more gaps, no more pulses. When Sri Aurobindo speaks about uh, the work to someone, and he says in the beginning, You think of the mother when you begin and when you end. Mm -hmm. And then he says, maybe you can begin to think in the middle of your work. And then eventually it becomes a process where you're always thinking of her. Yes, Yes. of course, uh, the problem is in the vocabulary itself. When you say you think of the mother, Mm -hmm. then I stop and think and get back. But that thing should be only a point of contact in which you feel more and more. And if this is our goal to grow into the intuition, that is to open the mind to her consciousness, then you feel her and as if invoke her presence. Substance of her presence. This is the important thing. You feel her closely. You feel her vividly. Almost like a dense presence of peace or love or joy or light or whatever way. I don't know what. I just feel her presence. And you have to infuse, invoke, let it fill, let her fill. And that's the true sense of remember the mother. Because you make a conscious effort then to open to her. And when she fills you, as you re-engage with your work, she's there inside, in your arm, in your thought, in your feeling, in your work itself. Of course, you may lose after a while because you go back to your old habit. But something has come in and begins to shape from inside the working. And so that, that becomes a very simple practice. <laughs> but still you will find in the practice these four different distinct stages uh, implied in this very simple articulation of it. 
But if you simply thought and went back to work, it would not do the same thing. It was more an, an awareness, yes, exactly. an awareness of her rather than thought. Yes, and joining in her, opening yes. to her, yes. letting her fill you, and that sort yes. of thing. Yes. Uh, in this context, um, um, in the India agenda, where mother is talking to her friend, there she's she's having a conversation and closing it, and she says, "Let's go and meditate." Mm -hmm. And he says, uh, and she's asking him, "Is let, is it helping you?" As and he complains to her saying that it's just silence, you know, it's just silence. <laughs> and she says that uh, this, is, this is something which I've worked on for years. And then he says uh, how uh, Ramakrishna used to get this imagery of the mother. So here, when you're talking about feeling her presence, we are still not hooking up with the image of her or yes, nothing. We don't right? need images. Because she's still saying this is white deformation. You don't need images. In fact, images can often limit. So much limiting because people catch the image that they miss her true form, which is beyond all images, which includes all images. So what will happen is, let's say, you know, there are people, and a lot of this comes from the very traditional, popular religious form of uh, stories and the narration. They will say, for example, so and so, all his life he did intense tapasya to have darshan of God. And so one day, Shiva or Vishnu or Durga, whatever aspect of the divine he is, uh, wants, appears before him with so many arms or so many whatever form it is. And now the person says, oh, finally I have you. And he bows down and then the form goes away. Now we see the problem of this form. He is there only inside that form. As long as the form was there, the form is gone. He has gone. And now I turn and meet uh, another human being. You are not Shiva, right? Because you are not that form. But if a human being comes painted in that same form, you might mistake that human and say, Shiva has come back, right? Where is the real experience then? If you fix, fixate on form, at best, form is for you an entry point to the experience of the thing in itself. What is Shiva's consciousness? Not the body. He is infinite. And if you truly experienced him in his totality, you would experience this humongous, gigantic whirl of the creative energy of the whole universe. Where is the form in that? Right? Or the same for Vishnu or Durga, in whatever aspect that they represent, but it will be a cosmic in scale. And even in that, the universe may be a form of him or her, that he exceeds all that. Universe is a tiny part compared to that totality. So if we are not clear of what we are really seeking, and that's why the understanding is so important, we tend to stop short and then that's it. So I've actually known of people who had the darshan. And then they said, okay, I had my darshan, I'm happy. Now I go on with my life. What was it about then? Was the darshan just an ego satisfaction? Heart's ego maybe, a love of devotion that says, oh, I have met my God, that's it. Now I know he's there. And now I get back to what I was. What's the point then, isn't it? So uh, somewhere the you may use a visual if it helps you to hold attention on her. But what is it that makes it her, not the fact that you have a photo printed on the wall, but the presence that fills, right? So you use the picture to focus on her presence, feel her or feel your love for her through which, as a gateway, you feel her love for you. And you enter into the experience of her love, or her presence, or her peace, or whatever aspect of her presence that you open to through that. And eventually, whatever you feel has to open out into its infinite form. And so if you feel her love, it's not just a patch of her love, it is her love that fills the whole universe, even as it fills you. Eventually it has to, you start with something small, eventually it opens to the whole universe and beyond. And then you have concretely the experience, her love which is beyond the universe, filling the whole universe and then filling you as her special child. And then you have the real experience of her presence. And with it, automatically, all the other aspects will begin to fill. And again, you can dwell on it. If you fixate yourself, Oh, I am just a bhakta, I will only feel her love. You have consciously shut her aspect of knowledge, her aspect of power, her aspect of even 
violence, violent and intense action and dynamism, which can shatter a whole universe, boom, and she's still that. So all these are different aspects of her. You really want to know her, you must know all these. To have known this and understood this is can save you the trouble, the error of stopping short. But you have to then want to extend beyond that. And it's like uh, initially when it, it is too much, like the sudden silencing of the mind, you are disoriented, you don't know what to do about it. Sometimes she reveals this overwhelming side. If you are too fixated on the form, she gives you a blast, breaking your uh, little shell. And then you may say, oh my God, what's happening? No, no, come back to this. <laughs> and you catch, cling harder to the little form. And this is what happens to... Um, in the Bhagavad Gita, when Sri Krishna reveals his form to Arjuna. In fact, Arjuna says, show me. And so, Krishna reveals his form and his cosmic aspect. And he sees that in that cosmic, all the asuras are included and all the devas and all the demonic beings as well as the divine beings. Everything is there. And everything is on a scale of infinity. So, he's so overwhelmed by that that after a while he can't take it anymore, he, he begins to shake and he says, enough of this, end this, end this vision, it's too much. Come back to your normal form of four arms. <laughs> so now he sees <laughs> four arms holding these little devices. Okay. <laughs> Familiar, safe, secure, little. So of course, the many people have commented on this. Does that mean that Arjuna used to see Shri Krishna in four arms, or what did he mean by that? But I understood it to mean simply that my current conception of this little simple you as, as the form of the divine, so familiar saves. So all of this really brings us back to the importance of the deep silence of mind, in which first we will train the mind to remain receptive, and second, we will train it to follow the suggestion which comes from the intuition to let it carry again in a state of stillness rather than ceasing to catch and warp and give it the form that I am used to. You see, one form it takes. I have to choose, will I do this or that, which is right or what does the divine want from me? And I deliberately give this example because it shows you how ridiculous the question can be sometimes. Should I eat chocolate ice cream or should I eat uh, kasata ice cream? I don't know, some name. Okay. Huh? Mango, mango. mango ice cream, all right. Chocolate or mango. What does the divine want me to do? Right? So there are people who will actually open a book. Open Savitri marker, what is the guidance? <laughs> They'll toss a coin, <laughs> what does the divine want? <laughs> I'm deliberately giving this example to show you how ridiculous the question is. But we assume that the divine will wants us to be a puppet, and which is not the point at all. The divine will is for us to become instruments of the divine freedom. And so to develop individual freedom is a necessary first step, and that's why the ego becomes a necessary point. But the ego must be constantly turning its impulse or desire to a higher goal. And that's how the change takes place. So it's not which one you eat, it's in what attitude you eat which matters. That's what the divine is concerned about, right? You eat all you want or don't eat, I don't care. But what you do or don't do, do it with that consecration, with that attunement to the divine presence. So when you ask questions, you have a preconception that the answer should fit these grooves. It should be either this or that. But the answer actually says, I don't care. But nothing in your receiving mind is ready for an answer that says, I don't care. Because the divine is supposed to be telling me what I should do, right? <laughs> I actually heard this recently. A person who receives intuitions, and sometimes quite interesting and very interesting intuitions. She can sometimes look at a person and tell you what happened to the person or you know, you went all through all this, you shouldn't do that, you should do this. And the person feels as if, oh, did you just read my mind? How do you know about me? So she has that kind of intuition, okay? And her problem is, every morning she tries to feel what does the intuition, what does the divine want me to do? And the divine intuits in her, you should wear this dress. 
And she says, but I don't like this dress and yet I wear it because the Divine wants me to do. And I asked myself a simple question, why would the Divine be concerned about which dress you wear or which ice cream you eat? <laughs> Coming back to that point, that's not real intuition. She has an intuitive power and because she can validate it by telling you what you were doing or what problems you're going through in your life, she's convinced that the intuition is correct. But in her receiving base of mind, there is a huge mixture in which things pop in which are not intuition, but she cannot distinguish anymore. And that's why I'm giving all these examples. You must be able to stay quiet and when the intuition comes, allow it to lead. And it leading is different from you setting grooves and forcing it to flow into your preconceived grooves. And that's why this general initial training of the mind is of great value. Often we have people who came with an untrained mind opening to the intuition and then these kinds of problems happen. So the mind was not made enough plastic, not enough conscious, not enough wide and flexible as an instrument. On the other hand, people come with such rigid structures of training. The fellow has done his PhD and his this and that in so many fields and he knows so much about everything that when the intuition comes, it has to move through these grooves. It sometimes, again, I reduce it to ridiculous to highlight the point. I was in a journey, we were going somewhere to some historical place, and I said something about that place, which uh, the other woman who's much older, she said, this is completely wrong, you don't know your history. This is how it happened. So I said, okay, to me it didn't make sense. She says, I know because I'm a history teacher. <laughs> okay, now think about what that means. What makes you a history teacher? You passed an exam which gave you this label, paper that says you're a history teacher. But what did you do to pass the exam? You read what someone else told you, mugged it up and vomited it out. How do you know what really happened? You are as ignorant as I am or as that little bird is. Right? None of us really know. We are just repeating what we were told. But instead, if you applied your thinking, if you applied your intuition, you might actually glimpse that the history was actually very different from what you were told. And this was mother's experience, by the way. In her childhood, she would read in the history books and they would say, this is what happened. And then suddenly she would say, oh, but that's not how it happened. That's not how I remember it. And it was totally different in the way she remembered it. But you know, this is that, uh, the mind of self-forgetful knowledge. You pick up something you want to know about, you read, and it triggers the memory. I say, but that's not matching. And what do you trust? <laughs> you have to trust that and not this. But those who are specially trained in rigid intellectual uh, thought, they have these grooves into which now the intuition has to struggle to flow around or learn to make it plastic. So both extremes are wrong. An unformed mind is not helpful, but you can start with it. A two-formed mind is again a problem. What you need is plastic, plasticity. And that can only come with humility. It can only come in a culturing of mind that says, everything I know, I'm open to revise. And what I have to learn before me is infinity compared to my little piece. And even when I receive the first wave of infinity, it is a tiny piece compared to the next wave of infinity. And with it, some, some training in which the mind has become conscious enough and is able to manage fine nuances of thought. Now you could start with none of that and the intuition could develop all this if the plasticity was there. But if you have trained it in your early upbringing, but not in a rigid way, but with a, let's say, intuitive feel in the early training itself, which should be how our education should be, then your mind would be a ready instrument for the intuition to fill and work in it. And that's what mother tried here in the ashram school. She found that the sadhakas who came with prior training, prior practices, prior disciplines of religious or spiritual types, were too formed, too rigid. And when she was trying to work through them, she was constantly bumping into these rigidities and uh, resistances, preconceptions, sometimes very rigid because you have the ego of, 
I am student of such and such a school of art, such a great artist is my teacher. I am the artist anyway. You never speak like that. You may be the most humble person, but the knowledge is embedded in this ego of its self-importance. And then mother is trying to express through you a new art. It cannot. And so what did mother do? She took Huta, who came with zero artistic training and built her from scratch. From basic sketching, sharpening pencils, cleaning brushes, drawing, mixing colors, all that. And worked through her. And just once that Huta, and she was very strict, do not do any other painting than what I make you do. Because I am working through your hands. She was infusing literally her skill and art into her. Once that Huta looked at a picture from a magazine and then drew her own. Okay, Mother saw the picture and got very upset. She said, where did this come from? She caught the vibration of that distortion. You know, mostly what you see in magazines are pictures intended to attract. So they have a strong, vital, uh, whatever, excitation. Something of that came through because she had used that as a model for her own drawing. And Mother said, never will you copy from elsewhere. What was she doing? She took raw material and built and the same thing happened in the sadhana. When she was trying to make people into effective instruments, she was hitting these boundaries always. Of course, not with everybody, but it was so prevalent that when the children came as refugees, she said, well, here's an opportunity. Can we train a new humanity from scratch? And that was her effort. And that's why I'm giving this example because it's one of the problems that the Divine Consciousness has to work in the evolution using the ready material we have. If our educational system was intuitively formed or filled with intuition or the psychic influence from the beginning, then the mind could grow and develop skills and complexities and richness of powers without being rigid, without being in this way fixed plastic to that influence and then the journey could be so much easier and I'm saying this so that someday some of you will develop these training modules or introduce at least these values into your uh, schools in your children whatever form it takes so I, I was going into what happens in the second aspect one is quieting the mind the other is allowing training the mind to be allow itself to be led without resistance, without rigid fixed preconceptions or grooves of expectations. To be totally open to, Sri Aurobindo uses this phrase, to be plastic to the touch of the infinite. When the infinite touches, you remember what the intuition is? It's a ray of the sun, little finger coming from the sun. When it touches, and yet it is from the infinite, when it touches, you should be able to be plastic to its touch. So this image is very interesting because you will see this in the Veda, of course, they speak of intuition as the ray of the sun, but you see the same image in the Egyptian uh, symbolism. You'll see the picture, it's a famous one, where you have the sun and then the rays coming from it, and at the end of each ray, there is a human hand, and the human hand is holding the ankh. The ankh is described, uh, if you read the literature, they'll say it is the symbol of life. So you have a little circle, a straight horizontal line and then a vertical line. So you can put your little finger on the circle and hang it. So it's like a cross but the top is not a straight line, it's a little uh, oval circle. And so the ray of the sun has a human hand that holds the ankh in front of the king or the priest who is now receiving it. You see the symbol is so powerful. It is a supramental consciousness as a ray of intuition now and giving you the ankh. What is the ankh? So they will say, oh, it is a symbol of life. For them, it's just some beliefs. No, as a symbol, it's very powerful. It's in fact the true symbol behind Christianity. In Christianity, you have the cross, but if you see traditionally before that particular form of the cross, there is uh, the ankh, of which the cross is a degradation. And the symbol there is very interesting. Sri Aurobindo says that symbol of the three individual, universal and the transcendent. And 
the vertical line is the individual the horizontal line is the universal and the ankh above is the transcendence so it's as if the divine is giving you through the intuition the opening to this triple realization literally it is experienced like that when the intuition enters it's like a touch and suddenly ooh just lights up opens up knowledge fills whatever way you may feel insight flash <clears throat> so in the quiet mind you are waiting for an answer and suddenly something like a little literally a finger touching the water in a ripple and the knowledge is there and then you wait for it to lead to guide your mind and to allow it to unfold all that it has to reveal so this will this will be the first training <laughs> quieting the mind with but with all this with the intention of opening it to become a receptacle for that second training is now the as a corollary it develops this idea a little more that as long as you are quiet you are still mind into which something higher than mind comes but you have to become intuition so this has to actually turn upward and as if rise beyond mental quality to something more and more refined and in practice it may take the form of this turning as if upward because we feel naturally the higher gradations above us because the centers which register those higher grades are above in the subtle body but it means literally that you shift your thought awareness itself out of the physical mind into your subtle body and in your subtle body opening it to the higher centers in the subtle body through which the intuition naturally flows so just as here in the center of your head is the center of the intellect so you feel yourself here or the center of the chest would be the center of the the vital energy or the higher vital and there you have the chakras the center of intuition is above the head and so it's not enough you can of course physically be here and turn your awareness above head but you shift not only the center of thought above head but literally lift the thought working out of the gross physical body into the subtle body and you have the experience of as if rising in your mind awareness and as you shift more and more into the subtle body suddenly you feel the mind released becoming wider freer more plastic more spontaneous you shift back into the dullness of your physical brain and you feel this dulling heaviness and you have to now struggle to think and form so this shifting is not only a physical shift of the center of thought but literally a shift in the grade of substance in which thought is taking place freeing from the physical mind is critical freeing from the brain and then once freed sufficiently all the rest becomes easy so this becomes the second practice that sri aurobindo recommends um in its most reduced form try to shift the thought itself to a point above the head where are you when you think you will find you are pretty much here somewhere and then it's as if in your thought maybe either you turn up becoming aware of the space above inside your head and then above the head so you're still identified with the body so you feel i am here in the body and then after a while you as if feel this space and allow yourself to drift into this space and settle here even as you continue to think as an exercise sri aurobindo writes this elsewhere in his letters he says when you shift your center of thought above head the first thing that happens is you lose brain fatigue as long as you are in the brain your thinking process makes you tired and after a while you say i can't think anymore i'm fed up at that point if you make this sh- conscious shift out of brain and above head you disengage from the physical brain suddenly you find your mind is free it's no more tired body is tired i am not tired mind is clear mind is fresh the second thing that happens is you realize your mind is much more free much more plastic much more light and so much more wide and automatically with this begins the shift into the working of the higher mind where earlier as as if the thought was dulled down and narrowed to your to fit your brain's smallness and dullness now suddenly you feel released into this much wider thing 
and the broader, larger thought idea forms can begin to uh, develop. And so the most basic exercise will be the shifting of awareness in the center here. But in it, the real fulfillment is when the thought is felt no more in the physical brain, but in the subtle body. You actually feel not in the brain, but around or wider or above. And one begins to live in that. This allows them to come to greater proximity to the focal point in the subtle body, which is the center of the intuition. And so through it, the intuition can fill your mind much more. But still your material of thought is only a refined grade of mind. But increasingly, as something of that begins to fill, you experience as if substance of something higher filling, a light of that higher filling, and your mind suddenly becomes clear, bright, fresh, and the shift to the seeing operation begins. So the character of the illumination, the illumined mind, begins naturally to fill. And all of this I'm describing as something which almost automatically happens by this simply turning. But if you're aware of it, you can even invoke it. You can consciously open to the wider presence above and invoke its peace and its light and let it fill and grow. And uh, very quickly, you feel as if the substance in which your mind thoughts are taking place become more clear, more bright and more lit up. So a question comes or a need to know comes and as your mind turns because it's full of light, it reveals and you know there's of course behind it the intuition proper. And so in that you know, ah yes, that's what it is. But it's effortless and it's spontaneous. And more and more therefore the nature of intuition begins to fill. And you know because something of the intuition is there in that seeing. Even in the core of the higher mind or large thought and so on. So this is the second movement of changing the grade of substance, opening to higher grade, higher center and freeing from identification with the physical brain into the subtle body where actually the real thought is taking place. So just so we understand better how this works, your subtle body, let's say this is your subtle body and this is your physical body, I'm making it slightly smaller, more rigid, they are identified. Okay, The extension of the subtle body around the physical body is what we feel as our personal space or aura. So they are identified, joined. But this is the stuff outside. In this stuff of the subtle body is the real thought taking place because it's in your mental body that you think. But because it is joined with the physical body, which includes the physical brain, what is happening here in its plasticity is bound here into matter. So now my fingers can't move, you see. The subtler part which is embedded in the physical is dulled by the physical. And because I feel I am body, I am only conscious of this part which is fixed in the physical body, not that part which is free. So what happens as you shift your awareness consciously towards that part, you realize you're actually thinking here and not here. And now you're free to think in the full plasticity of your mental body. And then you realize even the location of the physical brain head is only because the brain was there. Actually in your mental body, your thought is everywhere. Or even the sense of relationship with thought changes. Thought is felt as a thing, as a form. You can feel the thoughts entering within you. Or you can open and call a thought. You can consciously release a thought into the universe and so on. All of that becomes easy natural because that's the nature of your mental body. But right now you don't have it because you don't know your mental body, you know only the part of it embedded in your brain and nervous system. And the rest of it is as if tightened, rigidified because of its dependence on the physical. So the second exercise frees you. And in the mental body, because the center of thought also now is much more here, it's closer to the true center of intuition, its action now, its light, its illumination, its influence now begin to fill and can rapidly flood this mental consciousness. 
So this will be the second method. <laughs> and there are two more methods which we will then take up for next time. So uh, still from a integral yoga perspective, the descent from above is the be best way. But to train your mind to be like in the state of receptivity or silence, all these different methods can be used as a preparation. <laughs> so we'll continue this theme in the, part, uh, the third practice and fourth practice next time. Okay, namaste. Thank you.